Uh, my name is Scott Kennedy. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Freeman Chair in China Studies. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, have you all here today for uh, the China Reality Check series uh, discussion on rural China. Uh, the typical focus in Washington, D.C. Uh, is on high-tech China, um, the banking system, China and North Korea, and whether we're going to have a, a nuclear war, uh, or uh, the South China Seas, you know, uh, the 19th Party Congress. We, we talk about that stuff all the time. <laughs> uh, but we should spend a lot more time talking about rural China. One in 14 people about uh, live in rural <coughs> China. That's one in 14 people on the planet, not just in China, mm -hmm. right? That's altogether. 75% of China's future workforce live in rural China. Um, global commodity prices in agricultural goods are heavily affected by China's rural economy and agricultural production. China's political stability or instability is heavily affected by what's going on in rural China, not just what's happening inside Zhongnanhai, which we can't really know about anyway. <laughs> so we ought to be paying a lot more attention uh, to rural China uh, than we do. Uh, luckily, we have two people here today who are going to give us uh, an excellent view into what's going on, a turbocharged look and understanding uh, that we need um, to better understand what's going on in rural China and how what's going on in rural China is important for China and for the United States and the rest of the world. The first is Scott Rosell. Uh, who is the Helen F. Farnsworth Senior Fellow and Co-Director of the Rural Education Action Program at Stanford University. I think Scott is one of it, the most knowledgeable people anywhere on rural China. Uh, I am always amazed by not only how productive he is, uh, but about the intensity of his research. No one else drops into a research site with as many people to collect data uh, than Scott does. It's unbelievable the armies of experts that he has trained uh, that do research, including our own Maria Sinclair, who is in the Freeman chair, uh, who was working uh, last year with, with Scott. And luckily, he was kind enough to let her come work in uh, the Freeman Chair here in Washington, D.C., so we appreciate that. Um, but in addition to, and he's been doing this work for uh, over three decades now, uh, and uh, has watched the rise and changes of rural China more closely uh, than anyone. And uh, although he's written hundreds of articles, he's now working on his first book. <laughs> Uh, luckily, I, I think tenure is not a problem, if I understand probably. I think he's, I think he's, he's long past safe. Uh, but he's taking this on because he's going to bring a lot together and he's going to share a lot of that uh, with us today. I would say uh, part of the, the challenge of being so knowledgeable is also that you can be controversial. Uh, and in China, uh, there are folks that love his work and folks that don't love his work. Uh, but everyone pays attention to it. Uh, it is tremendously challenging when he's presenting the, 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 the quality and breadth of, of, of empirical evidence. Uh, Scott's going to make a presentation of 25 or 30 minutes on his, his research. Uh, and then we're also lucky to have with us today uh, Kristen Looney, who's an assistant professor at Georgetown University in Asian Studies and in the Government Department. Uh, she's published articles in China Quarterly, uh, China Journal, uh, Current History, and elsewhere. Uh, she has a forthcoming book on rural development uh, in mainland China, Taiwan, and South Korea. So perfectly well placed to uh, provide some initial opening commentary to Scott's presentation. Uh, we're then all going to sit up here afterward. Uh, I'll throw a few uh, questions at them, uh, and then I'll turn the floor over to the rest of you uh, for the remainder of the time. 
uh, for what should be a very vibrant and, and uh, enlightening discussion. So please join in me uh, in welcoming Scott Rosell. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Scott. Sure. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it's a uh, thank you. For the nice introduction. I, I, I thought the the first part about how we focus on you know um, the banking crisis or, or forthcoming banking crisis or any other part of uh, of China's uh, one belt one road go, uh, its industrial policy, et cetera, et cetera. That's these are really important problems. What I'm gonna to try to do today is tell you about the most important problem China is facing that no one's ever heard about. And, and that's sort of how, how the motivation was gone. Um, and uh, uh, I've, uh, I just told Scott, uh, I, I gave this talk in Tsinghua uh, last fall and in front of uh, uh, Bai Chong-un, who's a professor in the economics department there, quite influential guy, and he heard the talk for the first time. And then he found out I was gonna be in, in China for three months teaching uh, at the Stanford program. Uh, and he set up 29 talks for me last spring. I mean, all I did was fly all over China and gave it to every economics department, every, because he thought it was, he thought it was that important. And I do too, I give it to government officials and they say, oh, we haven't even heard of any of this stuff. And um, so um, I'll be interested, I've never given this talk in Washington. <laughs> So um, uh, it'd be interesting to get, to get your feedback and, and um, uh, uh, so um, see what you say about this. My group, uh, we're a group, uh, if you know anything about uh, the Poverty Action Lab in MIT and Harvard, uh, we're economists, do impact evaluation, um, we're sort of the j -pal of China, but we focus on rural education and we're very much interested in in narrowing the gap between urban and rural um, uh, education, because we think inequality is a huge, huge problem in China. And if you're gonna solve inequality, it has to start in, uh, with human capital. Um, and it's to identify the problems, but also test solutions. Um, I, I'm gonna try to convince you that this is a macro problem of massive proportions, okay? Um, and uh, so I'm going, uh, we're, we're based at Stanford. We have you know, a, a staff of, of uh, uh, eight people in Stanford with a lot of collaborators in different schools. Uh, our PIs are in Tsinghua, Beida, Runda, Renmin University. Uh, and then our, our main center is a MOE, Ministry of Education Supported Center in Xi'an at uh, the Shanxi Normal University called the Center uh, for Experimental Economics of Education. We have 100 grad students and a faculty of 12. Uh, and then since we do projects in the field, collect data in the field uh, all over rural China, especially poor areas, we need collaborators. Uh, uh, we work with, for example, in Kaifeng, he, Henan University. Uh, the person we work with is a wonderful lady. Every single county we want to go into, she says, oh, my student is the deputy bureau director of the education bureau, and he can get you in there. And, and that's why you need to have, uh, and plus we need their students to, 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 to collect data and to actually implement projects. So, uh, and we have a whole bunch of projects in different, in different areas. Basically, babies, elementary school, junior high and high school, and then um, because we're in Silicon Valley, we do technology and human capital. And uh, this is in the last 12 years, we've done over 50 experiments um, uh, in, in these different areas. And you can see most of them are in Western China, also in some urban communities, migrant communities around the big cities. Okay, I want to do three things today. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, to really tell you why. Actually, I think this is, is applicable not only to China, but to all middle-income countries or all poor countries that are ready to be middle income that want to become <laughs> high income countries. So I'm going to try to uh, sketch about why human capital inequality is something you should really worry about if you want to become, uh, a, a d continue on the growth paths from middle income to high income. Uh, and I'm going to talk about the nature of time as human capital, but really try to look at the sources of that because that's where you're going to attack it at, okay? Um, 
the motivation is this is a forthcoming book. <laughs> it's the first book I've ever written. I, yeah, I've written some academic books, but uh, uh, it, it's the motivation is uh, a book called The Other China that I'm writing. And for those guys who are about my age, uh, <laughs> you probably remember when you went to school, you read a book called The Other America. Uh, which was by Michael Harrington, um, and uh, it was it, and that book uh, got into the hands of President Kennedy and uh, uh, Vice President Johnson at the time, and it launched the war on poverty um, in the early '60s. Uh, I don't think we're going to launch the war on poverty in China with with this book, uh, but if it can do a fraction of that, that's uh, the, the motivation uh, of it. Okay, so he here we go. Uh, why do we should we worry about this? Uh, just probably the only <laughs> complicated draft that I'm going to put up here. Uh, on the bottom of here, this is like income after World War II, okay? And here's income today, okay? And so, you know, these are the low-income trap, the Somalias, right, the Rwandas, where they were poor before and they were poor after the lower left-hand corner. Those are rich OECD countries, you know, up there, the Canadas, the... Uh, uh, Germany's uh, Australia is, is, you know, is is up on the on the line there. Okay, um, I'm interested in in really two of these groups. One are I call them the graduates. Okay, so this is the only group of countries that since World War II have moved from middle income to high income. And I want you to t see two things. Okay. First of all, there's not very many of them, <laughs> okay? Uh, there's a handful of them, right? The, uh, you know, the, I have to say countries and territories. Uh, you know, the Taiwans, the South Koreas, um, you know, Spain, Ireland, New Zealand, Israel. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, those are, that's the group of countries that have, have, have made it, have graduated from middle income. Um, the other thing is, in the last 20 years, there's been zero. <laughs> There hasn't been one graduate in the last 20 years. So this is a hard thing to do, <laughs> okay? Um, we're gonna compare it to the trapped. Most countries in the world are trapped, <laughs> okay? This means for 70 years, for 80 years, they've been in middle income, okay? Uh, now, and, it's, and it's, it's not this nice steady state, right? It's they grow really, and they collapse, and they grow and grow and they collapse, right? And, and you know, the, the examples around us are endless, right? Uh, uh, look at Latin America, Turkey, uh, uh, Thailand, Malaysia. I mean, it's the, that there's this, this huge group of countries that, you know, have spent this last time. So, so what are the differences? There are many, many differences between these two sets of countries. I think... One of the most fundamental ones is the difference between the graduates at the time of middle income. So this is when South Korea was middle income, um, when Taiwan was middle income. The level of human capital of the entire labor force already needs to be at a level of a developed country. <laughs> so you, you have to have a developed country education system or uh, uh, outcomes of your labor force <laughs> to be able to support this move into high income, right? Um, and, and let's see, so look at the bottom here. There's an OECD, I'm gonna use one metric, which is the share of your whole labor force that goes to high school. Um, and uh, in, in the OECD countries, out of four people in OECD countries, three of them have been to high school. And then some go to college, some don't. Um, that they have the skills to learn how to learn in a developed economy. Look at the middle income graduates, those graduates that, that were there. They're, they're the same thing at the time when they're middle income, okay? They've already had everyone go to high school or three out of four people go to high school. And, and it's crazy, right? I mean, wages are $1 an hour in South Korea and 90% of the kids go to high school. <laughs> Right. Why would you go to high school when wages are $1 an hour? 20 years later, those same women who were at the, at the sewing machines are now working in offices. <laughs> they're accountants, they're financial assistants, right? And all those low wage jobs have left, okay? And they've been able to make that transition. Um, oops, sorry. Um, here's the trapped. Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, on average, <laughs> Look at the difference of that. Instead of three out of four, it's out of three, every three people in a trapped country's labor force. This is 20 to 65, right? 
<laughs> Only one of them's been in the high school. There's two high school dropouts <laughs> in there. And we know what a high school dropout <laughs> is like in the United States. If you're a high school dropout in the United States, the probability of you being on welfare, unemployed, <laughs> committed a crime, in jail, on drugs, and a broken family is many fold higher than the probability of you having a stable middle class life. Okay? Now, it's not a problem when you're a middle income country <laughs> to not go to high school, but it's a problem when you become a high income country, okay? And, and, and you're headed in that direction. Oops, there we go this way. So, so why is this important? Uh, sorry. Uh, when a country moves from middle income to higher income, wages rise fast. The nature of work changes from low wage, low skill to high wage, high skill. If a large share of the labor force isn't able to participate, you get this polarization, right? Um, uh, is the, the labor force, you either go into informal sector where there's no fringe benefits, there's no hope, there's no upward, you, 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 you go into quasi poverty, um, uh, or you go into crime. Uh, and you're unemployed and there's social unrest. That then affects investment, investment flees, you get this uh, stagnation and a vicious cycle and more polarization, uh, and then you start all over again, okay? Is, this is one of the dynamics that happens in these. So that's sort of what, I'm, what, what I really am dealing with in, in trying to say why we need to worry about the nature of the human capital in, in labor force. So here's China, right? Right in middle income. It's above the 45 degree line. That means it's done really well in the past 30 years. It's moving up almost from poor to rich, right? Uh, they're doing great. And, you know, of course, um, uh, we want, the, I think the whole world wants them to do better, right? Uh, uh, if Colombia stutters and falls, it's terrible for the Colombians, right? Uh, it doesn't hurt the world economy very much, right? But if China, I think that we could see a really different dynamic, okay? So what's the nature of China's human capital? Let's get into the second thing. Um, uh, uh, Scott's already referred to, uh, let's look at, Let's look at three-year-old children, right? 37% of the labor force in China uh, uh, is, has an urban hukou, <laughs> right? But they only have 24% of the babies, okay? 75% uh, of the babies are living and growing up in rural China or in a rural community in migrant communities, soon to be, <laughs> soon to be pushed out of, of migrant communities uh, given the current policies. So, um, uh, so, so there's the, the, the breakdown of, of, of the base. So we need to worry about them if we worry about China's future labor force. Uh, so let's see of how they're educated, okay? Um, at this critical stage of development, children need to get the skills they need in the future. You know, I don't think all kids need to go to college, but I think all kids need to go to high school in a developed country uh, economy or to get ready for that. So where is China? I've already made this argument. China has the lowest level of human capital in the middle income world. All those countries in that whole square China's number one low. <laughs> right. They have the, 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 the absolute low, the, um, uh, and this isn't my data. This is the census data. In the 2010 census, 1.3 billion people checked off a box. What was your level of educational attainment? Okay, and so from that, we are from 20 to 65, we can, you know, either have no education, primary education, lower secondary, or upper secondary high school, uh, college and university, right? Uh, if we just extract everybody that least had been to high school, there's the area under the curve, and it's 24%. So less than four people in China's labor force, only less than one of them has been to high school. No, right? How does that compare? To, uh, and, and I've already talked about it. The 76 percent of them are high school dropouts, right? Um, again, I mean, uh, it's not a problem now. High school dropouts make very, very nice products, right? Um, I was trying to get my iPhone X, you know, but uh, they aren't ready till, till, till February. Uh, we do a lot of work in that factory, um, and they uh, they like, love high school dropouts. 
In fact, they like low IQ high school dropouts in this factory. In fact, when they hire some at this factory, I can't tell you which factory it is because I'm a consultant there and I have a non-disclosure agreement, but when they hire people for that factory in Zhengzhou, um, <laughs> uh, they, give their hum they give the applicant an IQ test. And if you score too high, they don't hire you. Mm. Because, because it's such a boring job. It takes 12 <laughs> minutes to train you for your job on that assembly line. And they just want somebody, to, and if you have an IQ, you quit too fast, the turnover is too high, okay? And so it's not a problem in a middle income economy. But as we know, right, there's self-driving cars and there's gonna be self-made, robot-made iPhones, probably about the iPhone 10 or iPhone 11. So it's not going to be managed. China's going to lose 12. Every, the Samsung has now completely moved all manufacturing out of China. You guys know this um, you know, if, you, if you follow China. That's the big macro trends there. Okay, so here we go. So China is the lowest. They're low, they have lower human capital than South Africa. They have lower human capital than Turkey, right? Um, China is the lowest in, 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 in the whole world. So, uh, and that's the stock, right? That, that's the stock there between, look at the flow. The flow, the flow's got better. You can see more and more kids are going to high school over time, but still it's only half. Only half of the kids are going to high school today. Okay, the rest of them are high school dropouts. This is today in China, okay? Uh, and what we can see here is this is a rural problem. Okay, 92% of U.S. labor, uh, of U.S. 18, uh, not 20, uh, of, of U.S. 18, 19, 20 year olds graduate from high school. Uh, you know, big share of them take the GED, <laughs> but 92%. China, in rural China, it's about 93%. So China's urban gradu high school graduation rate is actually better than the United States, okay? But, it's, but you can see one out of three, a little bit more than one out of three of rural kids graduate from high school. So this is purely a rural problem, all right? Uh, look at South Korea and Taiwan, right? Everyone went to high school in the 1980s, <laughs> okay? It was incredible. I mean, I asked the Minister of, of Education, he was a former Minister of Education at South Korea conference, why did you guys do this? And he goes, I don't even, he says, I don't know. He, he, I never even thought about that question. Nobody ever asked me. And then he says, but you know, it must be because we're a Confucian country. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, the real, Conf this is the Confucian country right here, right? And, it's a, and look at Mexico. China, Mexico. China, Mexico. And we know what, in the last 30 years, what those children who didn't get a high school education in Mexico are doing. They did three things. They came to the United States illegally. They, um, uh, they're working in informal jobs in the economy or they're in crime in the cartels, okay? That's what kids, what are those guys in China gonna do as China moves in? There's only two choices. There's already a great wall, right? There's already a great wall, so they can't go anywhere, right? And uh, um, so there's two choices. And uh, I, I think that's, that, that's very relevant. Okay, so the, 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 it starts before high school. Here's junior high school. This is our work uh, with Peking University in Hebei and Shanxi. Uh, we went the first week of junior high. The kids had their new haircut, their clean clothes. They're all excited. They're in junior high school. And we asked, we did a survey. We said, three years from now, when you graduate, what do you want to do? 47% um, of them said, I want to go to academic high school. Okay, and 53% of them said, I want to do something else. Okay, so there was the split. Uh, and then we gave them a test. We gave them an IRT scale test. We can measure absolute learning with this test, okay? But this is the first part of it. Okay, we, we gave them this test. Um, and hey, you're not surprised. There's the 47% of the kids who want to go to high school. There's the 53% that didn't. There's a 0 0.8 standard deviation. A, these guys are already a couple years behind those guys that want to go. So this isn't surprising, right? I mean, you're doing well. You want to go to high school. You're not doing well. You, you're, you're not going to go to high school, okay? Um, what I want to show is then a year later, we gave them the second test. So we can measure how much did they learn in that first year of junior high? Okay, <clears throat> and look at this. Uh, the kids... 
the kids are going to go to high school learn a lot. Okay, they work really, really hard. You think urban Chinese kids work hard in high school? I know everybody's heard the stories there. Or if if you're from China, you know how hard you work here. Rural junior high kids work even harder because it's much, much, much harder to pass the high school entrance exam to get into high school in rural China than it is to pass the college entrance exam in urban China. It's much harder. Only, only one out of three kids have a spot in high school, okay? So eight out of 10 have a spot in college, okay? So, but look at here, this, that's not what I want to make. I'm interested in these guys. They don't learn anything. In fact, they have negative learning. They learn backwards. They know less math in second year of junior high than they knew in elementary school. All right? Uh, and if you know anything about the dynamics of Chinese schools, it's because I take all, all the kids, there's 70 of them in the class, I bring the 20 of them that want to go to high school in the front, or the 30 of them, and then the 30 that don't, I put back there and I tell them to shut up, I hit them, I beat them, I scold them, and they're not very happy, and they don't learn anything. Okay? And of course, if you're not learning anything, if you're getting beat, if you're getting scolded, what are you gonna, you're gonna drop out, okay? About a third of rural kids today drop out of junior high. Not high school, junior high, okay? If you look at the Tongji Nianjian, the, the Jiao Yu Nianjian, the, the yearbook of China, it says 98.7% of kids graduate from junior high. You know what, because this is, it's a millennium development goal, so they have to. Okay, uh, this is the reality uh, in the field is that, that one other, and, and if, if, if you're dropping out, you don't know how to read, you don't know how to write, you're angry at the school system for, and this translates, these guys have this deep seated anger towards the state, and it's the only part of the state they've ever dealt with. Okay, so what's the source of this lower heavy human capital? <laughs> Going a little fast here. <laughs> uh, uh, I kept saying, what do I want to tell people? And then, I haven't talked to Scott in a, a decade. I need to put a lot of stuff, so I crammed a whole bunch of stuff in this talk. Um, okay, there's two sources. There's absence of learning in primary school, and then um, we'll go to, to babies after that. I, I, and I, I, we have a whole bunch of stuff on this. We probably done most of our work here. Um, uh, the real source of the problem begins before junior high. When I first started working in REAP in the Rural Education Action Project, you know, it was easy to get donations. You took a donor, you took them up to a village, and it was this horrible adobe school, dark lights, three kids to a desk, no reading, teacher wasn't there, they weren't paid, blah, 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 right? I mean, it was just, uh, that's really changed over the last 10 years. So it's, it's, there, there's been lots of infrastructure built. The buildings are nice looking now. Uh, it's hard to find a really ugly school in most parts of China. There's some minority areas where it's still bad. Um, uh, the teachers are paid directly from Beijing now, which is, which is a really good thing. Um, uh, the curriculum, you may not like the curriculum, but it's the same curriculum they have in the urban areas. Um, so that's not the problem. I think the problem is poor health and nutrition of kids, okay? Because if, even if you took you know, a kid and put him in Renmin University's associated elementary school, which is the best elementary school in China, if they were sick, they're not gonna be able to learn. If they're sick with a disease that affects their learning. So is it true that school age kids are really so sick that they aren't learning? Um, we drew on, this is some of the, <laughs> thousands and thousands of, 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 of person days from college kids who don't need to go to college. You know, if, if you're in Chinese college, it's great. 99.5% graduation rate and no one needs to go to class. So we take, advantage, <laughs> we take advantage of that and take them to the countryside. And actually, they have a great, great time and we teach them and they really, they're really hardworking. It's fantastic to do work there. And so here's 19 of our studies. Uh, they're all over China, okay, uh, so it's very representative, and um, 133,000 of them <laughs> that we just beat up. We took blood tests, <laughs> we did vision testing, and then we took poop samples because we wanted to check for intestinal worms. We want to check for anemia, which affects learning. We want to test, do they have myopia but uncorrected, no glasses, and do they have intestinal worms? Okay, and this is what we found. This is China today. This is China today. 27% of the kids have anemia. 
33% of the kids have worms, and 25% of the kids have uncorrected myopia, have a disease that's going to affect their learning. Okay, and you put the Venn diagram together, right? 60 to 6, two-thirds of rural China's kids today are sick. Okay, no wonder they get to junior high and can't learn. Okay, I mean, that's the day. I mean, this is nurses and doctors doing these tests. These aren't economists. We're, we're, just, we're just organizing the data. Okay, and, 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 and that's today in China. You know, uh, if, if there's any Chinese in the audience that's like over 30 years old, ask them the first day of class when they went to school, what did they do? They, first day of the first semester, first day of the second, they took a deworming tablet. Okay? They dewormed 50 million kids every single year, twice a year. Today, the Ministry of Education won't allow any drugs in the school because one out of 20 million might have a negative reaction. We have 8 million kids per cohort times 10 cohorts. We have 80 million kids with worms. But one out of 20 million might have a negative reaction. So we don't give any drugs at all to anybody in any school. Zero. Mm. Right? They have to go to the hospital to get checked for worms. You know those poop, those poop tests we do? <laughs> you got to go to the hospital and get the poop test. You got to go twice. It costs 180 yuan no to get checked. And then it costs one yuan for the tablet. I can deworm the entire class for 60 yuan. It costs one kid who might or might not have worms 180 yuan to go get checked if they have worms or not. And it takes two weeks for them to get the, the results. They may never even go back. It's, it's, it's an epidemic out there, okay? So, um, and, and what our work has done is we go do big randomized trials and show that if you give a vitamin a day, a 10 cent vitamin a day, grades go up. If you give deworming tablets, cognitive scores go up. If you put on a pair of glasses, cognitive scores, <laughs> uh, educational performance rises, okay? So is one of the problems an absence of learning? Absolutely, and it's health and nutrition. You got every kid in rural China under one building. Go take care of them, okay? That's our, our policy implication of that. But it probably starts before that. Uh, poor cognitive development in infancy and toddlerhood. Uh, we, we worked for eight years here, and all of our collaborators, you know, the whole world is now focused on zero to three um, and, and the importance of that. And we finally got pushed there. Now half of our, half of our work is here because we think it's so important. Um, it's the first thousand days, right, from pregnancy till, born, till they're two and a half, three years old. That's when your IQ gets developed, 90% of your IQ. Okay, and that's the foundation for your EQ from four to six, six to 12. And that's the foundation for learning and that's the foundation for, uh, uh, for life skills, okay? Um, and you know, this is the, these are what the pediatricians and the child uh, psychologists say, right? By year three, 90% uh, of, of, of your IQ is developed, right? Lots of stuff happened after that for sure, but that's the, your, your, your basic brain uh, uh, development. Um, and this is Jim Heckman. This is what got the economists, uh, Jim Heckman from Chicago. Um, he says if you, if you invest one dollar into zero to three, you get eighteen dollars return for society and for individuals. Uh, for preschool, it's eight. <laughs> for, for elementary school, it's three. <laughs> for college, it's one. <laughs> for adult education, it's negative. It's a waste of time. 1 to 18, 1 to 18 there. How much does China spend? Zero. They spend nothing. Urban parents spend a lot. <laughs> they spend an enormous amount of money. They know. They figured this out. Okay. Uh, so what's the situation in urban and rural China? Uh, those guys, I'm sorry about that. Uh, here are IQ tests. I'll show you what this is. This is a Bailey's test. Um, there's been 10 million of these tests done since 1967. Um, and uh, there's a lot of work done in, in China's um, urban areas. They recruit healthy rural urban people out of uh, the hospitals and, and they get in these programs. And what you see is that um, in Shanghai, Beijing, Hefei, Guangzhou, about 15% or so of the babies that come through have development delays. 
Okay. Actually, if you did this in Washington, D.C., if you did this in Palo Alto, Sydney, or London, you come up with the same thing. Okay. It's about 15%. God made us like this, right? There's the IQ distribution. So you see uh, urban China, urban China is perfectly normal. What about rural China? Well, there's zero published studies, zero. No one's ever taken an IQ test of a baby in China in, until our group did it. And this is, these, I, I don't have time to go into this, that they're really fun to do. They're really hard to do. Um, it takes about three or four hours per test because uh, the baby, you know, then gets tired, goes to sleep, takes a poo, <laughs> ties a tree in the diaper. Um, uh, we, that, that, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's a big, big job. So what we did is here's our, our first study was in 2014 was three prefectures, 11 counties, 1,800 randomly selected caregivers and babies in southern Shanxi, all Han, no minorities, okay? So this... This is, this is not a minority problem. And look what happens by 24 months to 30 months, 1,000 days, 53% of the babies have IQs less than 90, are developmentally delayed, okay? And this is, this is a sample of 1,800. And you can see it deteriorates over time. Okay, uh, Hebei Lysa. Well, you know, we gave this. We said, well, it must be those Shannon people, right? All they eat is all they eat is min chow. All they eat is noodles, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay, so so save the children uh, uh, wanted to do the same thing in Hebei and 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 uh, Yunnan, and there you go. You know, forty. Uh, sorry, forty-five by thirty months. Forty-five percent in Hebei, fifty-one percent in Yunnan. Okay, are cognitively delayed. Then they said, well, you're working in the mountains. That's like the hillbillies. That's like going to Kentucky, Appalachia, right? Okay. Other rural populations, plains villages in Hunan and Anhui, migrant communities, resettlement communities, 600 baby. We did this this, this summer. Ah, hell, sorry. Migrants. These are babies of the, the, the ambitious migrants. 40% of them, 38% of them have low IQ. The migrants in counties, 41%. On the plains, 42%. In resettlement, 52%. Everywhere you look, between 40 and 50% of Chinese three-year-olds are graduating into toddlerhood and, and with this really poor development foundation, right? Um, uh, what would predict, so what's the cognitive level of kids in rural schools? This is also brand new data here. It, it, ah, sorry about this. Um, uh, the, the, the share of students. These are junior high kids. We gave them Rabins and Whisk tests. These are the share of kids with IQs less than 90 in junior high and, and elementary school. Everywhere you go out there, it's half of these kids have development delay problems. Okay, now, what you, what you say is, how can that be? No one knows. 40 years ago, when a baby graduated from, three year, from, from a three-year-old, they were expected to be a peasant. You had to follow a bullock around the field. You can do that with an IQ of 90, right? 20 years ago, you went to an to, to iPhone factory. You can do that with a low IQ. But once all those jobs go, right, and you become a developed country, what do you do in a high-income country, high-wage, high-income country? Uh, you're going to be polarized out of the labor force. Okay, wh where do children grow up? We know that. Why is IQ so low? Uh, I'm going to skip, s just skip a couple slides here. There's two reasons. Um, it's either, uh, three reasons, genes that you can't do anything about. It's either nut poor nutrition or poor parenting. Um, and the, the bottom line is uh, undernutrition is a real problem. Here's our nurses that now go do anemia testing for babies. Uh, we made those 1,800 babies cry 3,600 times because you, you poke both feet because you need two, uh, 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 two things. And look at, this is 16 to 18 months, right as they're formulated. This is the share that are anemic, that have micronutrient deficiencies. Okay, I mean, look at this, three quarters of the, they're sick, right? You know why? Because parents don't know. They have no idea. I mean, there's no outward symptoms, right? They just, they're raising peasants, 
when they should be raising college kids. Uh, here's in Beijing, 43% of the kids that are growing up in Beijing, migrant kids that are growing up in Beijing, are micronutrient deficiencies. 65% in the counties, 40% in Henan and Anhui, 53% in... Re I mean, these are, these are that you have a deficiency of your nutrition that's affecting your brain development, okay? Um, so malnutrition is a problem across everywhere. Uh, but uh, the big problem is stimulating environment. Uh, I like, it's not that they don't love their children. I love being with my child. I like playing with my child. I'll spend as much money as I can with my child. Um, these are my two favorite things. Grandma is holding the baby. What is your educational aspiration for, for your baby? All right. my, my first favorite figure is 95. 95% say college. They want their kids to go. Remember, two th a third of them drop out of junior high, right? But when they're a baby, they want their kids to go to college. My favorite, favorite, favorite number is 17%. 17% say they want their kid to get a PhD. <laughs> I love that. I mean, this is like, you know, fantastic. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> it's not worth it. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, but, but this is to show you, right? And then, and, and then, okay, but did you tell, did you talk to your kid yesterday? You know, 10% said, yeah, 90% said, talk to, to me. Did you read a book to your kid? 3%, 4% of the control and treatment group read a book to their kid. And you, you, know what their, you know what their response is when you know, our, survey says, our survey says, did you read a book to your kid yesterday? They laugh. They giggle. It's, it's like me, I don't know, how many, how many of you guys out there have had, like you, you had a turtle or raised a little, uh, in a fish bowl, a fish? Did anybody have? Yeah, right. Did you read to your fish last night? <laughs> Right, that giggle, that, that, that's the same response they have. I'm serious. They have no clue. They go, why should I read to my baby? They're a baby. They love their baby. They want their baby to get a PhD. But they have no communication. There's zero stimulation. I mean zero. Um, when, when we take donors up there, we go to the control villages and just let them walk around and visit the families. And the babies are put on the bed in dark rooms because they want them safe. They want their babies safe. And they feed them a lot of liangshi, a lot of noodles, right? Because they want them fat and strong, right? 70% of the households have zero or one book in there. Okay? I mean, there's, no, there's zero stimulation. So they love their families. Look at this. They take their kids everywhere. I mean, they take their kids, but they never, ever talk to them. So uh, it, it, is it a problem? What can be done? We have an intervention where we have a curriculum where we train moms to talk to babies. There's a bunch of toys and books that come along with it. Uh, and we use family planning commissioners to do the training. It's great. There's 1.5 million people without a job, right, after they got rid of the one-child policy, right? And uh, so these are our trainers. Um, they all are college-educated. They, they, they really like this investing in quality rather than restricting quantity. Um, and the impacts, look at the impacts. Up goes telling stories. That's the treatment group versus the control group. Control group doesn't change. Up goes reading book. There's a couple things to notice is we have big impact, but still about half about half of the, the, the caregivers don't read or don't tell stories to their kids. I'll tell you, there's one major problem there. Grandma, okay? Half, half of these babies are being raised by their grandma. And their grandma, won't, it's very hard to get them to learn. Um, uh, and here's the biggest thing is look at, look at our impacts here. Remember the control group has an IQ of 88, okay? Look at when mom is the main caregiver and we give her 26 lessons in 26 weeks. Her baby, her kid, her 30-month-old is perfectly normal. We're trying to get this published now. The reviewers don't believe that there was an, a rise of IQ of 10 points. They say it's impossible. What I say, no, it's not, is these kids have absolutely everything. They're safe. They're loved. They got the house. They got, they got everything. They just don't have stimulation. As soon as you stimulate them, boom, up goes. Up goes. Look at grandma as a main caregiver, no impact. <laughs> right? So absolutely yes. Uh, final thoughts. 
you know, what's China going to do, right? I mean, where, I mean, um, is, is it too late, right? Um, remember, if 40 to 50 percent of three quarters of three-year-olds have low cognition, and if 15 percent of the other one quarter, that's the urban people, that's just normal, right? That means 400 to 500 million people <laughs> in this country are developmentally delayed? I mean, I, I don't care if you believe this or not. If you see this, what you should do is to say, we're going to make this a national priority to go do testing across everywhere with a national representative sample. To do a national representative sample is $10 million. <laughs> okay? Uh, but I think that they, they ought to do that. Um, I, I don't know where China's going. Um, I don't see how they continue up and, and, and go there with, with, with this problem. If they started today, <laughs> um, how big of a problem is it to solve it? The last thing, how big of a problem is it to solve it? Uh, $5 billion a year could build an early childhood development center in every single village in China. Hmm. How much is that? Oh, that's one month of aid to Africa. So I always say, keep, keep giving foreign aid to Africa, but just do it from January 1st to December 1st. And December's aid, give it to babies, right? And... Um, uh, but it's the biggest problem that nobody knows about in China. So um, uh, I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Oh, you want to sit down? Wow. Uh, Scott, thank you so much. Uh, a tour de force. Uh, super helpful. And uh, we're going to put uh, Kristen on the spot now. Okay. And, uh, give you a chance to, for initial thoughts. Uh, you've stimulated, uh, thank you for the stimulation to me, <laughs> right, and, and for everybody else. Uh, so um, I'll turn things over to Kristen and then we'll uh, continue with the conversation and then with the audience. Um, hi everybody, thanks for having me here today. Um, excuse me. I think everyone can hear. It's okay, just, good. Exactly I think I speak for everybody in the audience when I say that this research is incredibly impressive. Um, the findings are quite startling and very important for people to be aware of. So I'm not surprised that the scholar you mentioned booked you 90 or 29 times to give this talk in China. <laughs> I, I felt like 90. And I'm fortunate. <laughs> felt like 90. I'm fortunate that you came to DC to give this talk. Um, Coming from a political science background, one thing that I'm interested in is understanding more about the political and institutional causes, the roots of this kind of problem. Um, you talked about how China is quite different from South Korea and Taiwan historically in terms of their moving from a middle income position to a higher income position. You know, why were they different? Um, uh, you mentioned you talked to uh, somebody in the South Korean government who said they're a Confucian country. Well, so is China, right? Um, parents in all three of those societies um, value education, I would argue, um, to the same degree, right? But uh, practically, there are, there are different outputs. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, just to offer my own kind of preliminary answer, which I do not claim is correct, um, you know, Japanese colonialism plays a big role in why Taiwan and South Korea had such high levels of educational attainment very early on in their development. Um, my understanding is that during the colonial period, um, in order to create loyal Japanese subjects, um, peasants in Taiwan and South Korea were given a primary education in Japanese, right? So that very uh, basic level of educational attainment was achieved during that time. Of course, higher education was off limits. Um, for the majority of farming families um, in South Korea and Taiwan. And perhaps because it was, um, there was a clear barrier, right, a clear distinction between what Taiwanese and Koreans could attain under Japanese colonialism and what Japanese could attain. Um, in the post-war period, it made it that more urgent for these newly formed governments to open the doors for higher educational achievement to the local population. Um, and in China, it's just, you know, it's a different historical context. And I'm just wondering why, why we haven't seen, especially during the reform era, a bigger push on the part of the government um, to increase levels of educational attainment. Um, and that raises another point, which is, um, you know, there were major achievements under the Hu administration, in particular in terms of realizing free compulsory education, right? And you mentioned that you don't think 
for example, access to um, a, a decent school building is necessarily a problem anymore, right? Um, but I'm wondering what, you know, about the limits of those achievements. Um, so one of the big policies of the WHO administration in the mid-2000s was to realize nine-year compulsory education in China and make that actually be free, right? Because prior to um, those policy changes in the mid-2000s where the central government assumed financial responsibility for young people's education, uh, it was left up to local governments and most often individual families to pay for education. So the financial burden from, uh, for, for education, at least from my understanding, has been resolved. Um, but I think it's interesting you're focusing on high school because that falls outside of the purview of the, the nine years of compulsory education. Um, and then in addition to some progress made on the front of providing free education to uh, everybody in China, there was also a big push in the mid-2000s to expand um, medical care, right? Um, and I'm, I'm not an expert on the new cooperative medical scheme, but my understanding is that it provided basic health insurance for almost the entirety of the rural population. Um, and I'm sure you've come across the limitations of that program. And so, um, you know, in a minute, I'd like you to talk about what you think those limitations are. Why are we not seeing children get free, you know, testing for worms through the new cooperative medical program if for the first time in uh, reform era history or Chinese history, um, you know, what I mean is post-49 history, um, they actually do have medical insurance. Does it not cover those basic preventative, um, preventative things that seem from your analysis to be really easy intervention? <coughs> Um, then another kind of deeper level question I have is, is just China compared to other middle income countries seems to have a much more rigid rural urban divide. And that has to do, I think, with the history of how the economy was planned in the Maoist period, these institutions that rigidly separated rural from urban areas, and the tinkering with, but nonetheless maintenance of those institutions in the reform period. And I'm just wondering if, compared to other countries, this issue of rural-urban inequality in China is just far more intractable and institutionally rooted than it was in, than it is in Mexico or South Africa. And if that's the case, aren't we talking about major institutional reform that would be required to overcome these kind of differences between um, rural and urban China? Um, another thing that I was thinking about while I was listening to your presentation is just the party state's development ideology, right? Um, I know that there has been a shift among the central leadership to move away from GDPism and growth first ideology and to prioritize things like um, environmental um, outcomes, positive environmental outcomes, and uh, social welfare, human capital, et cetera. Um, and that cadre or you know, local official evaluations, their performance reviews, et cetera, have been altered, to my understanding, to reflect some of these other goals besides just hard economic growth um, numbers. But it seems that there still is Maybe the change in development ideology has just not taken hold or taken root, um, but it seems like investment in human capital is still, it's still a problem. And I'm just wondering what else the central government can do to kind of change the mindset of local officials and emphasize those programs more. Is it, is it because it's more difficult to measure those outcomes that they, they get underemphasized? right, um, in terms of government performance reviews and their prioritization of things? Is it because it's harder to quantify these human development outcomes? Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, on the problems related to that. Um, and the interventions that you're proposing seem quite easy to execute, right? It just seems completely irrational that the Ministry of Education would take away a deworming pill, right, if it has the effect that you're finding. Um, and. Uh, I don't know. As a new parent, I have a almost one-year-old. She's going to be one next Monday. Stimulator. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm listening to this thinking, I should read more to my child because, you know, I, you know, I do read to my child. We have a lot of books in the home. But it is frustrating as a new parent. I mean, all she wants to do is chew the book, right, or throw it across the room or take it off the shelf. So I can understand a little bit grandma's frustration, right? Why? I mean, 
why should I talk to this child or buy books if they're just going to throw them across the room and chew them and not pay attention or listen to me, right? It's hard to see, um, even from my perspective living in this country, knowing how important early childhood development is, it's hard to see the effect of that stimulation, of right? There's definitely a lag. And I'll just add a personal anecdote about <laughs> early childhood education in China. Um, I have uh, friends who, Chinese friends I've known for a very long time who are kind of pioneers in the education field um, in China. They open a few migrant schools in Beijing. They also, in their hometown of um, uh, Xinjiang in, in, in uh, Henan, they opened a preschool. And they used a lot of Montessori methods <laughs> in formulating their curriculum for the preschool, and they have all kinds of interesting toys. And I visited the preschool, and it was fascinating and wonderful in so many ways. Um, yet they allowed me to interact with some of the parents who were dissatisfied that there was no homework being assigned at the preschool, and that the children were not learning Chinese characters, right? English. And that they didn't understand. Yeah, they weren't learning English. They weren't <laughs> learning Chinese characters. They weren't learning yeah. mathematics. And I'm thinking like. Of course they're not, they're two years old. Like, why would they be learning those things, right? These other activities that, um, and I tried to explain to them, oh, well, a lot of these activities that your children are doing here are exactly what children in, in my country are doing in, 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 um, in preschools. Um, but there seemed to be this, they were fighting an uphill battle in trying to convince these parents who were paying a lot of money, um, you know, that, that what they were doing was, um, was valid and legitimate. And so I'm just wondering what your experience is, too, in terms of overcoming that resistance in rural communities to some of the interventions that, that you're proposing. Sure. Um, I apologize if my thoughts are kind of scattered all over the place, but those are some Fantastic. of my original, my, my initial reactions to your presentation. And I'm really excited about this book coming out, and I will assign it to my students at Georgetown. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> And even even the, even if they chew it, it's, it's, it's still be positive. And they definitely will throw it's it across the room. Exactly. Absolutely. Right. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much for that helping that uh, kick really things off. So as as I as I heard your your comments, they were uh, split uh, into sort of two categories, mm -hmm. and we'll uh, have Scott give an initial reaction, and then we'll throw things open to the audience. The first uh, category I'd put under the under the label of institutional. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned the sort of comparative China versus other countries. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the institution of the hukou system mm -hmm. and rural urban divide. And you mentioned uh, bureaucratic incentives for local officials. Mm -hmm. And maybe these are just hard indicators, harder indicators, so it makes them less focused on achieving those because they can't. It won't help them with promotion. Mm -hmm. Those three types of institutional things that you mentioned. And then you talked. To, about sort of differences between administration priorities and mm -hmm. perhaps with the, the who and when administration focused on uh, making school less expensive, at least mm -hmm. up through middle school, and, right. and then uh, investing more in, in healthcare, mm -hmm. right? So sort of changes in priorities. So maybe, Scott, if you want to first take a stab at yeah. those institutional things and then maybe policy priorities between the different uh, uh, administrations. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, uh, I think just three chapters in the book, you know, <laughs> your, your question. Um, no, the, the great questions, and, the, and they're right at the heart of it. I mean, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, it, I think that, um, uh, you know, yeah, there's, there's I think it, a lot of it is Japanese colonialism <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that's underneath there, and, um, and then it's, uh, urbanization in Hukou is huge part of that. I, I have a friend who I, when I studied Chinese in, uh, at uh, Taiwan Normal University in the 70s, uh, he was one of my teachers for uh, like substitute teachers and we became best friends. He, he, when he graduated from Taiwan Normal University, he became a principal of Jingmei School, which was a rural school in the suburbs of Taipei. It was in rice paddies, right? It, it's now downtown Taipei, right? But uh, at, at, in the 1970s, it was, and they had one class per grade level. Well, one, you know, there was 70 kids in first grade and 70 kids in second grade, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he was principal of that school for 30 years. When he got done, it was the biggest school in Taiwan, mm -hmm. and it had like 23 first grade classes and 29 sixth grade classes. And because what they did was they invited 
you know, invited. They, they welcomed every single rural person in Taiwan to move to Taipei. <laughs> you wanted them to move to Taipei because now you could recruit really high quality teachers, you could give really high quality education and do it for a much cheaper price. <laughs> it's twice as much to give education to a kid up in a rural school than it is to give them in downtown Beijing. It's twice as much, right? And you get, yeah, I don't know what the quality <laughs> multiplier is, right? Mm -hmm. And so a, a lot of it is, and free preschool, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, a lot of that is all, you know, colonialism. <laughs> that, that goes. So, so that's, that's certainly one of the problems. The hukou system is absolutely horrendously bad for this. And, and it has, we know it has to go away for many, many reasons. Uh, I, I think there's many, 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 many reasons why it's not going to go away. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, this is a huge, you know, development problem. Uh, s second is, I, I like to calculate as decentralization, I mean, mm -hmm. as another institutional. So, um, yeah, we've done all these things. And, and the, the state has centralized teacher salaries and building of new schools. Okay. Mm -hmm. But the execution of schools and the overall budget still comes from the local uh, fiscal uh, resources. Okay? okay, there's transfers from above. Right. Okay, but they still do rural education. I'm doing a project now, and it's it's uh, it's it's been one of my favorite pet projects. And what I do is I have a, a six minute survey form, and I send it out to graduate students. I send it to my, my colleagues who are uh, in graduate schools around China, and they give it to their graduate students who are 25 to 30 years old. Okay, and the survey goes something like this. Uh, do you keep in contact with your high school classmates? And of course, everyone in China does. <laughs> right? and they all have, do you have a WeChat group? Yes, eight, 55 of my high school classmates I still keep in contact with. How many of those are rural? And if the answer is zero, then you're done with the survey. But, then, <laughs> but, but if you don't, about, about three quarters of the people that, we, that are in graduate school had rural classmates for high school. Okay, and this is 10, 10 years ago. Okay, then we basically ask them, where are those high school classmates who have a rural huko today? Mm -hmm. Three is the answer. Three percent went back to their home county. Mm -hmm. Three percent went back to, 97 percent of them are out there. But the responsibility for investing in rural education is the local county. They have zero incentive to invest in rural education. Zero. There's no incentive whatsoever. Okay. There's no incentive to invest in rural health. Mm -hmm. NCMS, so, so the, 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 the rural health insurance, that's great, right? But the doctors are horrible. Mm -hmm. the, the doc, we have a, a half of our, this is another of your questions, uh, we have a brand new research program on the quality of rural health care. Um, the probability of you going to the doctor, the probability of you being hurt by going to a doctor in rural China is higher than the probability of you being helped. Oh my gosh. It's def if, you're looking at, if you're looking at asthma, diarrhea, uh, pneumonia, uh, TB, uh, any of those, is the probability of being hurt is higher than the probability of being helped. Okay, that, that's, it's just true. So yes, expenditures on healthcare have gone up by 10, 10 times in the past 10 years, and 60% of that is from rural um, uh, medical insurance, okay, 40% uh -huh. of it is out of pocket, okay, uh -huh. but rural health, qual uh, rural health outcomes haven't improved at all. Uh -huh. Zero improvement in rural health outcomes. So, and it's because there's zero, there's absolutely zero incentive for these counties. And then if you ask them, why don't you give out meta, why don't you give screenings to your kids? Why don't you give them uh, good nutritious lunches? You know what they always say? Mei Chen, we don't have money. Mm -hmm. We don't have any money. And then what we did, so that the second part of our survey, once we took the six, six question, the six minute survey, is we say, next time you go back home to your home county, Take out your iPhone or your Huawei phone and take pictures of all of the infrastructure building in your downtown county area for the urban citizens. And 
I tell you, the poorest county in China has a walking street with bronze statues and riverside parks and hillside parks and temples. I, I, I wish I could show you. I usually put it in my presentation. Uh, there's this beautiful pagoda in Pingling County right downtown in the middle of the, right on the side of the Guangchang. It's this gorgeous thing. It lights up at night. Everybody looks at it and takes pictures of it. It's the Bureau of Agriculture. It's the Agriculture Bureau, huh. right? That they, they spend all this money on. And then you say, why don't you give your, why don't you give your kids healthy lunches yeah. in school? <laughs> Nei Chen, okay? So, so it's these, these things. The, the, the last thing I want to say now, so, yeah. is what about the incentives for the, uh, for the institutions? And, and it, it's like anything, right? It's, mm -hmm. you know, um, why is education in the United States ranked 17th? as a priority for the leadership, right? It's because if I get these babies healthy, even if Xi Jinping gets these babies healthy, he's not gonna be around when they enter the labor. Even if he's still, uh, still you know, the Xi Zhu Xi, you know, by uh, 30, 35, that's when those kids are going to the labor force. So it's a long-term, so short-term long -term, short -term problem, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Thank you very much. It's a um, uh, terrific intervention, yeah. terrific responses, frustrating. <laughs> to, to listen, actually, mm -hmm. uh, yep. because of the, it, it seems inexpensive, but politically, right. the, all the incentives point in another direction. All right, everyone has been super patient. Uh, let's uh, open things up to the audience, uh, questions, comments. We'll start here in the, the front. <laughs> and uh, please wait for wow. the, if you'd wait for the microphone, since we have an online audience, and then identify yourself and in your institution. Thank you, Scott. Yes. Thank you, Scott. Our 30 years, yeah. I, um, <laughs> colleagues. <laughs> I'm deeply disturbed mm -hmm. and puzzled. I'd like to ask you, what has happened over the last 30 years? Are we using the right metrics to measure the conditions of human capital in rural China? The few, few developing countries that have invested more and have, more, have, have had more concentrated rural development policies than China. What has happened? Um, I agree with you that the rural in, uh, uh, urban rural income differentials are horrendously great, <clears throat> one of the greatest in the world. But nonetheless, if you look over the last 30 years, average per capita incomes in rural China have increased at least 10, 15 times. Yeah. What has happened to all that income? The few countries that have electrified the rural areas, that have paved the roads. Uh, Hu Jintao introduced free rural education, or Wen Jibao did that in the early part of the 2000s. They had rural debug programs, rural uh, health insurance programs. What, what has happened to all of that? I'm not questioning the accuracy of your measurements, but I'm totally puzzled because I've been associated in earlier times with rural development programs. And I have two, so I'm puzzled, but two specific questions. Um, you haven't mentioned India in your comparatives. How does rural China compare with rural India, human resource conditions? Secondly, how does Chen Chi Wen react to your observations? Respond. Okay. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> these are great questions. So, uh, in, what's what's the glue that holds everything together in in an economy where inequality is you know fifty Gini is fifty to fifty five whatever it is right? Uh, um, it's of course the whole pie is getting bigger, right? Um, everybody is better off than they were twenty years ago for sure. Okay. Um, now, uh, what do they do with the money? Okay, and, and oh, but, but one, one last thing, and they think until now. I mean, Marty White's question, you know, he's, he's studied this from Marty White, the sociologist from Harvard, has studied this for many years. His question always isn't, are you better off than you were 20 years ago? Do you think you're going to be better off 20 years from now than you are today? Yeah. And until recently, that's always been yes. People have thought this is going to continue. Okay. Um, a little anecdote is I take lots of student groups and I take, you know, donor groups up into the countryside to, to do different stuff. 
up until recently, because I'm not rich enough, up until recently, I used to take my wallet out before we went. I'd take out a 100 yuan bill, and I'd say, anybody who finds a 20 to 35-year-old man up in the villages, this is yours. And of course, student groups, all they do is they look for, they look for those guys, right? They want that $15, you know, $15. I, they, I never spent anything because there were no men there. Uh, today, you see lots of men. Not, they're not everywhere, but there are many men. And it's my construction site shut down. I spent a month and a half looking for another construction site to do work, and I can't find one. Nobody's hiring. Right? My factory shut down in Shanghai. They say they're going to start up in the, in the fall, but, you know, and they're sitting up there and they go, and I go, what are we going to do? That's right. what they're starting to ask. What are we going to do? Okay. Um, now, they got a bunch of money. Okay, that's your, this is the second part of your thing. They got a bunch of money from all the different things that you said, from rising wages and everything like that. Okay, but... They still, there's still a battle for the wallet. Uh, Esther DeFlo and, and Banerjee's uh, book called Poor Economics has a fantastic chapter called Battle for the Wallets. Okay? And it's even if you got money in your pocket, like, why don't you buy a book for your kid? Why don't you buy glasses for your kids? Why don't you buy, you know, meat for your kid? Well, every single dollar that they pull out of that wallet comes at a cost. And the cost is three things. Saving for catastrophic illnesses. Great NCMS programs for a cough. Families have to pay 80 to 90% for catastrophic illnesses. Okay? Retirement. <laughs> okay? There's no Social Security. Okay? It's great Social Security in the cities. There's no Social Security in, in, in the countryside. And three is getting your son married in a, in a, in a, in a society with huge sex ratios and balances. Um, uh, e the easiest thing in the world to do is go ask someone, uh, your three-year-old kid, your three-year-old boy, how much is it going to cost for you to get your three-year-old boy to get married? They wa the, the, the average time for them to answer is one second because oh they've already figured it out. In Hunan and Xinyang, a million yuan. 600,000 in Gansu, 700,000 in Southern Shanxi. That's what it's going to cost to marry off my son. They'll tell you to the, and that's husband and wife working for 15 years and saving half of their salary is to get your son married. Okay, okay? so that's what's happening with the money is there's no social, there's no social programs underneath it. So they don't want to spend their money on these other things. I got three boys. It's, I'm glad I don't live <laughs> in that. <laughs> it's going to be really hard. Exactly. So, I have three boys, too. I'm yeah. glad I'm, yes. you know, I'm married. So, all right, let's go to the next question. <laughs> Who would like to ask a question? We'll come right here in the front. Great question, Peter. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, Professor. Uh, I'm a law student at the GW, George Washington University. And I'm actually from a rural part of China in Jiangxi province. And from my uh, observation, my elementary school uh, in the small village is actually closed a couple of years before. So my question is, do you think that by moving the kids into the cities through urbanization, China, Chinese government is so solving the problem of the human capital and education? And I have another question is, I, I am witnessing the trend of people coming back to villages for it's like fresh air, peace of mind, and I mean we have better infrastructure. We even have Wi-Fi now. <laughs> so, do you think that do you see in your research that the trend of people coming back to village? That's my two question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, so the the question is is that there what there's this uh, there was. In 2000, there were 200,000 elementary schools, and now there's 100,000. Uh, they've actually shut down 100,000 elementary schools. Um, and, and what he said, do you think this is good, uh, that they've moved them all to the countryside, moved them all to the city? So first of all, they haven't moved all the kids to the city. What they've done is they've done a school merger program. So we shut down village schools, and we built big centralized schools in the towns. Uh, 
Okay, so they're Zhongxin Xiaoxue, okay, in, in towns. And we shut down all the Jiao Xue Dian, all the, the village schools, okay, like your schools shut down. Uh, we use those village schools to build the, the early childhood development centers, by the way. They're great places for, for ECD centers, so because they're abandoned state buildings, right? Okay, um, so you have to do that, first of all. You can't, I mean, no matter how much you want to educate your kid at, at at school, at, in your own village. There's just too few kids to educate. So you have to have these centers. It's good and they're bad. When they come together, the quality of education goes up. There's better teachers. Um, they, they have better curriculum, longer hours, everything like that. And if, but the problem is, is because you live so far away, is that half the kids have to live at school. So they board as a seven-year-old. You're a boarding school student as a seven-year-old. And that's not good in any situation. It's not good when you have absolutely no support. I mean, they just get thrown into these rooms and they eat, you know, in cafeterias. There's no teacher taking care of them or the minimal taking care of them. And so what we find is there's a positive effect on grades from having better schools. And there's a negative effect on grades from having to board. So these kids from these villages, it's like, I get up, but uh, you know, there's no change in my educational outcome from going to these much better schools. Um, now, they're supposed to have sheng huo lao they're supposed to have counselors, they're supposed to have uh, a very good, and you say, why don't you have a counselor? Why don't you have nutritious programs? And they say, mei qian. Mm -hmm. They say they have no money, right? And then you go point to the pagoda, that's, a, that's a, the agriculture bureau, and, and it's, it's an incentive problem, is that there, there's nothing to do. So uh, the second question. Do you see they're training people coming back? To oh, yeah, no, no, not, not at all. They're not going to, okay? They, they're, I mean, they might go back to Yenqing, you know, outside of Beijing, or you might go out to, you know, um, Fuyang, you know, outside of Hangzhou or something like that. But, but nobody should be up in the mountains. I mean, you know, nobody that we know. Um, we know that urbanization, uh, that, that modern developed countries, 90% of the people live in the cities. Okay? That's just because when you're in the cities, you're productive. There's conglomeration effects. Now, maybe 20 or 30, 40 years from now, in an internet, new internet economy, maybe that's going to change. I mean, uh, but as of today, at least the last 100 years, we know that urbanization is development, and like it or not. Um, and so you don't want those guys to go back there, right? There's not, I mean, I don't care how good the, the internet is. Yeah. The internet sucks, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> Why don't we collect a, yes. uh, uh, two or three comments I'll, I'll for the end. I'll keep them shorter, okay. And uh, <laughs> yes, so we'll come to this gentleman here and then this woman here. Okay. Thank you, Scott, for your very inspirational uh, lecture. And also, I'm looking forward to the book. I think it could uh, provide valuable lessons to uh, Chinese scholars as well as, as the government officials. Well, I, I would like first to share my my experience about you know I'm a, a I, I was raised I was educated by when I was very young by grandma. I don't quite agree with you about you know the the way you measure the the IQ of the uh, toddlers like three years old. I think you, if you ask the questions like, uh, I, have you re uh, did you uh, read a book to your child yesterday? Simply, if, if these grand grandmothers were, uh, are illiterate, definitely no. But if you ask uh, her, I, have you, uh, did you uh, uh, sing a song to your child? Or just say, tell her or him a fairy tale, I think? Probably yes, you know. <laughs> I think I, I think it's uh, you couldn't say that reading a book is not as good as uh, singing a song to a child. I think that's equally important to, to improve the IQ maybe to, uh, to to your to your child. This is my first observation. A second, I I noticed that uh, most of the statistics. I think uh, in, your, in your presentation, uh, you you used these statistics maybe seven years ago, twenty. Ten, I think that's uh, in the, uh, s uh, seven years have I uh, have been passed have passed. I think great changes have 
have uh, taken place in during the past seven years. And uh, you know, China has uh, launched a very massive poverty relief campaign, and the uh, uh, object is to relieve the remaining 70 million people who is uh, who are living uh, under object abject poverty out of poverty. I think that's uh, that's we are very close to to realizing that goal. So my question is, uh, how do you think this uh, poverty relief campaign will change the landscape of the rural poverty, especially in terms of the education? And uh, I know that say, in, in this kind of uh, poverty relief campaign is not only about uh, uh, providing adequate food and clothes, it's also about education. We are, uh, the government is planning to build more and more kindergartens for the rural poor. W I, w according to your observation, what do you think this uh, poverty uh, relief campaign will change, will, will help? Thank you. Perfect. Why don't we come yep. over here to get the one more yeah, comment I got it. at the same yep. time? Sure. Okay. Thank you, um, Professor Razel. Uh, my name is Victoria Ryan. Uh, I feel very appreciated uh, that you collected so much data and provided so, uh, so many um, very interesting information that can be of reference to the Chinese government. Um, my question is that um, you have proved quite strongly about um, the human capital's role uh, in terms of uh, affecting a country's uh, uh, chance to get uh, to become a high income uh, country do you believe uh, human capital is the single most important factor that affect a, co a country like china's uh, chance to become a high income um, country and have you got any uh, reached any conclusion about uh, how high uh, human capital would be for a country like china to reach such a level yeah thank you yeah. Yeah, uh, let me answer this question really quick. Um, uh, it's one of many. I mean, uh, uh, good development policy, especially as you go to middle income, the high income is, is very complicated, right? You need good industrial policy. You need good intellectual property rights. You need good social programs. You need, um, and uh, I, my point is, is that I, I think that the human capital base is, is absolutely essential. It's necessary, it's not sufficient, it's necessary. And if you, as you see, as the countries that didn't have it, don't develop. I mean, I don't know, that's not proof that you have to have it. Uh, the other thing you should notice, I, I wanna be very fair, is all the graduates, every single one of the graduates is a small country, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's never been a big country graduate. So maybe there's different dynamics under big countries. Um, uh, you know, c coming back over to, to, to this gentleman's question, uh, it hasn't improved in the last seven years. It's got worse, okay? Um, uh, China tried to expand vocational ed uh, at the high school level. So, it's, you know, uh, the leaders really, uh, I don't think they get the fact that in developed countries, in a high-income country, you're, the workforce is changing all the time. I mean, we know how much it's changed in the United States over the last 20 years. You need to learn how to learn. You need to have math and computer skills and good language skills and, and critical uh, thinking skills. You know, that's what you learn in academic high school and, 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 and college and that kind of stuff. Vocational ed, they're trying to teach people how to repair tube TVs mm -hmm. or fixed telephones. Right, <laughs> they've removed every telephone out of out of Olympic Park now. There are no more telephone booths because no one uses them. Right, but there's an entire major in vocational ed fixing telephones. <sighs> right, and of course it's completely useless. Right, and uh, and and of course rural kids know it's useless, so they don't go to vocational ed. So the the number of kids going to vocational ed has come down over the past seven years. So uh, we're actually updating these figures with the 2015 mini census. Um, that hasn't changed. I mean, it, it, there's a few more kids that go to high school, but 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 not many. I mean, this is this is a huge this is this is a fundamental problem. Okay, there's no high schools in rural areas. 
three quarters of the kids are in rural height are in rural areas and there's no high schools to go to right this is this is not a problem that that gets solved you know overnight so it's not it's not the last thing and the second part is oh uh, grandma uh, uh, so we actually ask four questions uh, this is from a Mika survey, which is the child development survey. We ask, do you read to your kid? Do you tell your kid a story? Do you sing to your kid? And do you interactively play with your kid? Okay, and I just abbreviated that. Only 25% of all caregivers sing to their kid uh, in, in a week. And 5% of grandmas sing to their kids. Okay, most of them say, I don't know any songs. Okay, your grandma was fantastic you know that's why you're here today exactly uh, so I, I always i always get this i always get this i go i don't believe you because look at i grew up with my grandma i only ate rice when i was a kid right and look at me i'm your i'm your colleague at stanford and then I, what i always tell them i go go back and get the list of a hundred of your tong twindaren, of the, of, the, mm. of the same kids who grew up in your village at the same time as you, and tell me where 95 of them are. Mm -hmm. They're toothless, they're, they got big calluses on their hands, they're hunched over, right? And they got six grandkids, right? Because, and they're only 47 years old, right? Um, be, because that's where most of them are. There are geniuses that come out of these uh, out of every village, right? Um, and, and so uh, it's, I mean, those yeah. are the facts. Our, our, our IQ test, by the way, our, that's not the IQ test. That's the parental investment. The IQ test is a three-hour interactive test that has kids playing and reacting and, and that kind of stuff. So wow. it's called the Baileys. So. Tremendous, geez. Um, I think it's a path-breaking uh, talk today and, and, and discussion. Um, even though we're not focused, uh, and a lot of our research uh, in the Freeman Chair here, we're focused on the same bigger question, which is about how do you improve productivity in China, right? How, and improving productivity is partly through hum improving human capital. It's also through improving technology, but doing so in an efficient way. And even though China is throwing tons of money, tons of money at high tech and shiny bright things, they're not doing so in a very efficient way. So you're having productivity pr challenges wherever you look um, as well. I, I would say in terms of the, the frustrations, uh, that's not unique to China, right? Um, of course. How many cities in the United States want to, are willing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on football stadiums <laughs> uh, instead of spending them on other things? Uh, preschool. <laughs> uh, look at with the state of Wisconsin to bring things a little full circle. In the $3 billion it gave out to have a company from Taiwan come and build a factory there. Um, and instead of that money going to other places. And it'll create like a thousand jobs max, right? So, so uh, I think what, what, what I hope to see in the, in the book is what are the, what, uh, despite the political obstacles, how can we manage, if you're putting together a politically savvy strategy to get them to take the five billion and spend it wisely instead of putting it on, spending it on the pagoda. I think that will be the, the challenge um, but I know what my, re I already have my 2019 reading list, my 2018 reading list. <laughs> I've got your book on the other China, I've got Kristen's book coming out on rural development uh, in East one. Asia. Uh, and, and so I know that, that next year is going to be uh, a banner year for scholarship, for, for learning about what's going on in China and the region, and for addressing critical questions. Everyone please uh, join me in thanking both Scott and Kristen.